Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Katie Kapler and I'm one of the co-founders at Inscribe and I'll be guiding you on this tour of Inscribe um, this afternoon. Also with me is Danielle Bonner from our team. So just a few housekeeping things. If you have questions along the way, um, please don't hesitate to post them. You can either post them in the chat um, or you can post them in the Q&A section. We'll monitor both and Danielle will be in there kind of answering as we go. I'll also pause periodically to see if there are questions that have come in so we can talk about them together. And Danielle knows that she is um, totally empowered to interrupt me because sometimes when I get going, I don't pause often enough. So uh, we'll just make sure that we get to all of those as part of this process. And um, just to kick us off while I get going, if you wanna just drop in the chat, um, maybe who you are and where you're from, if there's anything special that you are hoping to learn today, definitely let us know. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna kick off with a few slides just to kind of, if you're not, you know, if you're new to Inscribe, um, just to kind of orient you a little bit to our mission and what our goals are. But we will then jump right into the demo and take a look at the product in action. Um, so at its heart, Inscribe is a student support platform that, you know, we really try to tap in the con to the concept of community and community engagement to help connect students to answers, resources, and the people within their institution that are really critical for their success. Um, so the way it really works is it's designed to create an experience that, you know, in some ways kind of cuts across some of the traditional silos that may exist in the education space. So Inscribe really can be deployed at any stage across a student's journey. And sometimes that means we're working specifically in one area, you know, the example here like onboarding. Um, sometimes it means that a student's Inscribe community really cuts across many aspects of that learning journey. But really what our goal is, is to help simplify for students the process of knowing when I have a question, when I wanna reach out to somebody, what do I do and where do I go? Um, and so Inscribe's a great solution for that. And uh, as, you probably, as you sort of referred to there, we really do have sort of multiple use cases for which the platform is designed. And here are some of the common ones. Um, so definitely things related to student onboarding or student services. So those would be things like registration and financial aid, um, certainly academic use cases. Um, and in those, in those instances, maybe Inscribe's being used for an individual classroom to help facilitate Q&A and conversation. Um, oftentimes what we'll see is Inscribe can be used to create a shared space for multiple classrooms that are teaching the same content. So maybe you have 10 or 15 sections of your first year math course and you want students to have a shared space where they can go to ask questions and connect with each other and maybe with the TAs that are supporting them. Um, so that's very common. And then, um, you know, often when we have students who are in like a shared program like um, a nursing degree or a business degree, um, the community itself will ori around, uh, orient around that program. So from the moment you're enrolled all the way through graduation, you have the space where you can communicate and collaborate with students who really, you know, are, are very likely to have sort of similar goals and background and aspirations to what you have. And we'll took at a high level, we'll look at those three use cases today. Um, other things to have in the back of your head, enrollment is definitely a place where we see a lot of um, activity. So these are students that might not be part of your institution yet, but they're really curious about um, what it's like day to day. They would love to get stories from peers and some of your student leaders. Um, and then on the other end of that spectrum, faculty. So most of the conversation today is gonna to orient around students and how we support students. We know that faculty, especially in the last year or so, um, are also individuals who thrive on being able to collaborate with each other, have a place to go when they need help. And so we see a large number of institutions now building communities specifically for their faculty to connect and, and um, chat with each other. But really regardless of the type of community building um, you're building, the purpose of the community, there's two main goals that we, um, we see the community serving. One is getting people answers. So no matter who you are, at some point, you're gonna have a question, you're gonna get stuck on something. And a community is a great way to help people no matter what the time of day it is, no matter what topic they have, to know where to go to ask that question 
and get help from their classmates or from the experts within your institution. The other great thing about the community is those questions are not transient. So um, once it's asked and answered, the system tags and stores it. So the next student that comes along and has the same question can actually find that answer right away. So they're getting the help that they need more quickly and your support staff is not having to answer that same question 10, 15, 100 times every semester. So the communities really are like a living, evolving knowledge repository that is constantly updating itself so that the content is most relevant to what your, um, the folks at your institution really care about and really need. But the other aspect of the community that's really important is about connecting students to each other and to other individuals in the platform. So we say like finding your people, but we all know that building relationships and having that sense of belonging uh, at an institution is really critical, not only for the student's ability to succeed while they're learning, but also about the relationships that they build and then take on with them after graduation. So we'll look at some examples of how you can use Inscribe to create spaces for students to find one another, to kind of build these relationships and talk about things that, you know, may not be specifically relevant to getting unstuck with, you know, a challenge in my academics or my registration, but are really important and a, a huge part of what higher education really is. So with that, I am going to um, jump over to the demo so we can actually take a look and see what it's like in action. Any, any immediate questions that have come in, Danielle? Not at this time. We have a couple of people joining us um, from the East Coast, nice and warm in sunny Florida, and then a couple actually here in Colorado as well. Awesome. Well, it's snow as if you're in Colorado, it's snowing today. Uh, but it's supposed to be 60 by Friday. So that's why we live here and we'll be we'll be living the Florida life in a few days. Um, so let's take a look at the communities in action. I am going to demo Inscribe um, kind of as a standalone platform to start, but I do want to point out that 99% of the time, um, you know, individuals are not logging into us directly. You can do that if you want, but most of the time Inscribe is integrated into the tools and workflows that you already have on campus. So maybe that's your learning management system. Maybe that's your student portal websites that you're hosting, emails that you're sending out, text messages. Um, we can do integration points in any of those locations. We really, our philosophy is we should be where your students, faculty, and staff already are and make it as easy as possible for them to engage with the community when they need it. So that's all just part of the implementation process and we can guide you through that along the way. Just to orient us here, um, we are in the Inscribe organization. So usually that would align with the, your institution. Um, and then we are in the College of Business and Entrepreneurship community. So this is more an example of one of those program level communities that I was talking about. Um, but it's, you know, at an institution, you can have one or many, many communities and students can easily belong to multiple communities. So um, really it's thinking about, you know, if you have different purposes that you wanna deliver, then you would set up maybe a couple of communities that people could join and belong to. Um, but in this case, we'll, we'll start with this. And then within the community, um, content is generally organized by topic area. So that facilitates navigation and discovery. It'll also flow through into your analytics. Um, and it also comes into play in the integration, which we can we'll look at in a little bit later. And then the other way you can organize information is through channels or subgroups in your community. So in this case, we have created channels that are related to the majors that students might have in the College of Business and Entrepreneurship. And um, as a student, I can explore public channels and join the ones that are most interesting to me. You can also create private channels, which you know, a student would only be able to join if they were invited or if you explicitly added them to that community. Um, so from an organizational standpoint, I'll just really quickly touch on some of those other use cases so you can see how the sort of setup might change depending on the purpose of the community. So in a student success community, where we're really thinking about things like onboarding and um, student services, you know, now our, our cohorts are more around student groups or student identity. And um, the topics are now going to focus a little more on study skills, um, financial aid, registration, things like that. 
Um, and then in an academic community, now maybe I'm creating channels for individual sections. Uh, this would be an example of like many students learning math altogether, but I still have a channel just for my uh, faculty member and classmates I'm in a course with. And now, you know, maybe it's week by week, we're gonna take the topics that the students would be learning in that class and create topic areas around that. So I think the point being, all of this is customizable. Um, depending on the use case that you have, we, we can definitely come to the table with recommendations and best practices based on our experience. But it's really about, you know, you, you being able to reflect to your students what you think is most important to them and the words that are gonna resonate for them um, based on just their relationship with you and the institution. Hey, so Kim, any questions have, about just organizational structure? We have two questions here. Yeah, please. So the first one is, uh, do we have anyone using this for alumni? Um, yes, we do. In fact, there's sort of two ways that we see it being used for alumni. One is specifically just for alumni. So we want a place where they can talk to each other, the school can talk to them, um, and they can sort of continue to have a relationship with the institution. Um, the more common use case, I would say, is where alumni are brought into the communities that students are also a part of. So for example, we had an enrollment community where prospective students wanted to ask questions about how did you use your degree or is this the right track for me? And they included alumni so they could share their experiences of having been at the school and what they did after graduation, which was really neat. Um, and then you could also you know, imagine in these program communities as students are thinking about graduation and what do I do with this degree, you know, or just wanting to network, having alumni participate in the community as a conduit to life after the degree um, is a really great way to incorporate them. Um, I do think that's a good point while we're on that topic. So the inscribed communities are designed to allow um, access for, I mean, I think it's sort of been clear by the use cases, but it doesn't just have to be your students, faculty and staff on campus. Mm -hmm. If you have practitioners from the community that you wanna bring in, if you have alumni, if you have prospective students or even parents, um, we can set up the authentication so that you can allow those individuals in to participate as well. Beautiful, that actually goes into the same vein as the next question. And that's um, going back to finding your people such as you know, student parents. Yeah. Are students able to find these communities on their own or does the institution need to populate those communities? Um, so the channels here are initially created by the institution, but then discoverable by the students. So um, as a student, I could come in here and sort of self-identify and join the groups that are most interesting to me. We do have examples of communities where um, they are, are either turning over the process of creating groups to the students themselves, so they can just form the group when they want to, or um, creating spaces in the community where a student could, you know, fill out a quick form and say, I would like to create a new student group. And then at least that way the institution has some, um, there's some gatekeeping to like the proliferation of groups, but it, the students are having a direct influence on what those are. Great. Is there a limit to how many um, channels? an institution can have? We haven't hit it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to say no. I pro there probably is some practical limit at some point, um, but you know, 10,000 might be a little bit too many, but not um, technically there isn't a limit. All right. Well, that's all the questions that we have in the chat this far. All right. Let's move ahead. So since I'm in this community, I'll just demo from this community. Um, so really the heart of the platform is the conversations area. Um, this is where students are, you know, posting questions, sharing ideas. It's very iterative, very student driven. Um, when a student goes to start a new conversation, um, they can decide, and this is kind of going back to that duality of purpose, like, do I need help? Am I here to sort of connect and create social in, um, for social engagement? So you can, you can choose at the time you're posting whether you're asking a question or whether, you know, it's more like I'm sharing or contributing something to the community. Then you're going to summarize your question. Um, and, you know, fill in some more detail. If you had already been in a topic area, the system would pre-select that topic for you. 
but um, you know, the, that can always be changed or you can pick multiple topics to assign it to. Now, one thing you probably noticed as I started typing was this little pop-up that came down here. So um, one of the goals that we talked about early on is that the community is designed not just to create a social space for students, but also to make the process of connecting and getting help more efficient. So we really want the content and the answers that are being provided to get reused. And there's a couple of ways that we do that. One is that we have a full search of all content in the community. So if a student comes and they have a specific question, first thing they're likely to do is search for it and just get straight to that answer. Um, if they do bypass that and go straight to the asking, we have, um, this is Rosie. She's kind of the technology layer that lives within and helps support Inscribe. And one of the things that she'll do here is just subtly suggest resources and answers that might help this student right away. So the part of this is, again, getting the students to answers, but also just reinforcing the reusability of content in the platform. Um, one other thing I'll note, and you can see the little editor here. Uh, I'll show you in a second. I wasn't sure this is actually going out, I think, today or tomorrow. So I wasn't sure if it was going to be ready in time for the demo. But this is getting a little facelift. So I'll show you what it's going to look like in the next 24 hours. Um, but before I do that, I will point out that there is the option for students to post what we would call privately. So um, rather than all peers and everyone in the community seeing my post, just the moderators. So like your faculty staff um, would see that post. And it's a way for, you know, if you're new to the community, if you're a little shy, um, maybe you have something that's not relevant to everybody else, you could post it in that private mode. Um, and then I'll post my question. Now this will pop to the top and everyone in the community is gonna get an email notification letting them know that a new conversation has started. Um, it includes the content of the conversation and people can click right back through to engage with that post. Um, because I get this question a lot, I will say, uh, you will set the defaults for notifications in your community and then your individual members can adjust their notifications. So maybe they'd prefer to get a daily digest at the end of the day that tells them a summary of everything that's happened. Uh, maybe they really do wanna hear right at the moment that something's being posted. Um, or maybe they just wanna snooze their notifications for a little while. So they have the ability to do that. Um, so while we're on the topic, I'll just jump over and show you quickly what the new editor is gonna look like. Um, so we made it a little more explicit in terms of asking questions and sharing something. Probably the biggest change you see here is just how the editor is displayed. And our goals with this were to really encourage the and highlight the multimedia aspects of the platform that people really gravitate towards. So imagery, videos, making that really easy to do. Um, we also added um, some tools to help you embed content more easily. So this is a pretty simple example. It's going to embed the website and do the unfurling. Um, but you can use this to embed forms, um, surveys, polls, other documents from other sites. So it's a really nice way to have the flexibility of incorporating that into your workflow. So know that, that by the time many of you are using the platform, this is what it's going to look like. So that would be a good orientation. Um, once the question has been posted, um, it's really easy to see. So again, we are alerting you outside of the platform to what's happening. You do not need to be hovering around inside of Inscribe, you know, waiting for that. Uh, we'll let you know. But when you do get into Inscribe, it's really easy to know kind of what's happened and what's changed. So you can see that there are any questions that don't have a response. You can immediately jump to those um, and provide answers. As a moderator, you can also see questions that have no moderator response. So maybe a student has jumped in and answered, but you want to make sure that you're also, you know, chiming in or, you know, reviewing that answer and providing some feedback there as well. So you can do that too. And then you may choose to, um, and we'll look at this in a second, flag a question for follow-up. Maybe it takes a longer answer. You don't quite have time for it yet. So you want to flag it and get back to it later. Um, or you want to alert somebody else to come in and take a look at it. You can flag it and you can quickly get to those here. Um, but once a question has been posted, you can provide feedback. So you can upvote the question. Um, we will count the number of views. Anybody can also follow a question. So, wow, that's an amazing question. I also have it. And please let me know when the answers come in. So now I'm going to get notifications about answers flowing in there. Um, as a moderator, you can also edit or delete anything in the platform. Here's where you would flag that item to come back to it later. And, you know, down the road, if this post is 
you know, not relevant anymore. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it was from two semesters ago, you can archive it. So you haven't deleted it. It's still part of your analytics, but it's now no longer gonna appear in searches and be right in front of students' eyes. There's no limit to the number of answers that can be provided. Similar WYSIWYG editor, so you can bring in images and videos and files. You can also reroute a student back to an existing resource or conversation. So if you, know, you feel like this has already been handled in another discussion, you can kind of point them back in that direction. So again, kind of getting to the value of that reuse. And then you can kind of, you can see that as a moderator in this community, I carry this little badge with me everywhere I go. So it's a great quick visual cue for students to see where the, you know, the community managers or the community moderators have been participating. Um, if this were a student answer and it didn't have that badge, as a moderator, I could come in and endorse it. So it gives it kind of that same accolade and the endorsement is carried. And that just helps students kind of orient toward this as maybe the certified answer. Uh, and now it means I don't have to take the time to type it again. So I give credit to that student for their great con contribution. And now everybody knows that that's probably the answer that I wanna give the most priority to. Uh, any questions about the conversation side of the house? Uh, it does not look like we have any questions in the chat or the Q&A at this time. Awesome. So there is this other area of the platform called the resources area, whereas conversations is very student driven, very iterative. Generally, the resource area is reserved just for the moderators of the community. And it's a place where you can add supplemental content, videos, articles, web links, um, that also help students and help answer questions, but maybe in a more curated kind of fully formed fashion. And, but the same idea applies you, when you go to add a resource, you'll get a little editor that has a few more features, but very similar to what we saw in question asking. You would create a new item, add your content to that item or upload content from another system. Uh, right now it's just in a draft format. So you'll be able to see it, but it wouldn't actually be visible to your students. And then when you're ready, you would open it up, add additional tags if you wanted to, and then publish that resource. Now that gets added to your repository and is available to students. I will say in the resources space, usually the way that that um, area of the platform grows over time is on day one, most of the institutions we work with have some you know, set of things laying around. They're in a Google Drive folder or their you know, assets that they keep somewhere that we just preload for you into the community. And then um, what they'll do is wait and see the kinds of questions that students are asking. And if they see questions that are really popular or that um, maybe keep coming up over time over time, um, they'll use that to drive the creation of additional resources. So don't think you have to come to the table with like 10,000 resources predefined, ready to go. You can grow that space over time just in response to what you hear from your community and what the students really need. Um, so that's really the heart of like where the communication is happening. I want to, before I get into some of the other features of the platform, I did want to jump over and show the integrated view because I think that's really important, especially if the access point for your students is possibly going to be like from the learning management system. So before I jump over there, Danielle, let me know if there's anything else you want me to touch on. Can you touch on FERPA a little bit? I know that's always top of mind. So talking about student privacy and protecting um, um, stu against student privacy in general. Yeah, you know, I will, we'll talk a little bit about profiles since those kind of come together. So in our system, um, we are, you know, each individual has a profile. The only information that Inscribe knows about your students is um, that we'll for sure know about your students is their email address. And then usually we also get handed over uh, first name and last name. However, um, you can configure your community so that the only people that have access to that information are the moderators. So you can see this little box here where it has my full name, my email. Um, this is not visible to other members of the community. And, you, and by default in our community, we are showing the full name, but you could change this to be just um, first initial, last initial, or um, first initial, last name. So essentially sort of obscuring the names of the students. 
And then each individual student has the ability to come in and modify their profile. So they can change what their display name is. They can choose to add a little introduction about themselves or not. So there's a lot of ways for students to have agency and ownership over how they appear to other members of the community and what access to their personal information anybody has. Um, so that has benefits on both sides. So from a FERPA, FERPA perspective, you know, students really have control over that data and information um, and can configure it to be what they're comfortable with. On the institution side, you do know who these folks are. It's not an anonymous platform. And because of that, students are generally on their best behavior in Inscribe. They understand that it's an academic and professional space. They understand the purpose of the community is to be supporting one another and to be um, diligent in their academics. And that is what you see played out. Um, in every single one of our communities, uh, we see that the norms of the community are well respected, um, really regardless of the type of community that we're launching. But since we are on the profile page, I will touch on um, one other aspect, which is the reputation system that's built in. So we really want to give students credit and celebrate their participation in the community, especially because communities are generally not required, right? Any cont contribution that you're making here is something that you're doing voluntarily. And so we think about the contributions in the community along three lenses. You know, what conversations are you starting? So you're asking great questions. Are you putting really thoughtful ideas out there? How are you participating? So are you providing great answers? Are you continuing a discussion or conversation in a meaningful way? And then how, what are you consuming in the community? Um, we call it being a good listener, but you know, are you taking the time when you have a question to actually search and see if you can find the answer for yourself? Are you um, paying attention to what other people are saying and learning from that? And so we'll give you a little credit just for getting started, then for ongoing participation, and then for those folks who really are outstanding and demonstrating that level of leadership, giving them that leadership badge. And this is a great way, I think, not only to encourage students to participate and continue to participate, but it's also a great way at the institution level to maybe start to identify some student leaders that you might want to um, leverage in other aspects of the institution. Maybe they would make great TAs for, you know, an, if they're in an academic community, maybe they would be great members of other student leadership groups. So really the participation in Inscribe is um, student initiated, student driven, and a great way to practice and articulate some of those really important soft skills that we want our students to learn, like you know, information literacy and collaboration and communication. Um, so watching their behaviors in Inscribe and letting them have this space to try out some of those skills, I think is really important as well. So you mentioned some of the uh, more positive flags that are risen through the, this reputation system. Can you tell us about the safeguards that or actions that would be taken if somebody posts something inappropriate? Well, yes, I can. Let me see where we have that. So there's, there's a couple of things that we've put in place in the platform to help, um, to help keep the community healthy um, and sort of on track. So one of those, I mentioned Rosie. So one of the aspects of Rosie's capability is kind of helping monitor and alert people to things that are happening in the community that a moderator might wanna you know, uh, prioritize and come in and intervene. So one of those activities is you can provide us with a list of keywords. And if they ever appear in the community, Rosie will flag that post and escalate it to the moderators to see you know, if they wanna um, intervene. I think the where our head always goes when we talk about that is everyone's thinking, oh, I'll put you know, all the dirty words into this list. And if anyone posts them, we'll know. And of course, you know, that's a really common. Um, but again, I think in the, you know, all the years that we've been doing this, we've never once had somebody post a dirty word. But the other way that it gets used is if there are just things that you want to know if students are thinking about. So if like terms like dropout or financial aid or, um, 
you know, or even I think we had somebody write the, the guidelines for citing things in a paper. I don't know, it was, it was moments that they knew that students sometimes really struggled with and they wanted to know immediately if a conversation like that was taking place. So, um, but the other thing that Rosie will do is she will run all the conversations through a sentiment API. So she's measuring the emotion of the conversation that is taking place. And if the emotion becomes really charged, so angry, frustrated, um, the system can identify that and will flag it and escalate it. So here's an example of, you know, somebody's getting really frustrated, they feel like they're on the edge and Rosie can sense that she's now flagged it and said, hey, you might wanna step in and intervene. So a great, um, what we've heard from moderators is it doesn't necessarily mean that this student has been inappropriate, but it might mean that this is a conversation that isn't relevant to everyone else in the community. So I might move it into that moderator only status. Um, or it might mean this is a student that I know I need to pick up the phone and call. So 90% of your students are gonna do great just sort of helping themselves in the community, but there are a handful who probably do need that direct intervention. And to the extent that the community can help you identify them, you know, that's really what we're setting out to do. Does that help, Daniel? Yeah, wonderful. That answered a question that we had in the chat. We have one more question in the chat. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who a good candidate would be as a moderator within a community? Yes. So there's really two answers to that. One is whoever is answering these questions today um, is a great resource to have as one of your moderators. So they're probably dealing with these questions through the phone, through email, maybe in in-person meetings. Um, so giving them a more centralized space to answer those questions and again, do it in a way that they can do it once and not have to do it 100 times will we'll save time in their day ultimately and let them focus on other higher level tasks. Um, and you can in a larger community actually subdivide ownership. So um, you probably don't have the same expert managing your registration questions as your financial aid questions. So you could assign the area and registration to that owner and then assign the financial aid questions to a different owner. So there is that option as well. The other candidates that make excellent moderators are the students themselves. So if you have student leadership groups um, or alumni, you know, former students, or just students who are really enthusiastic and excited about being part of this process, we love watching the energy and the enthusiasm that they bring to these communities. And, um, if you ever have the opportunity to tap them and bring them in as moderators, we highly recommend that. Wonderful, thank you. Yep, of course. So let me quickly show some examples of the integration work um, in case that's top of mind for some folks. So we're switching context a little bit here. Now we're moving to more of the example of um, an academic use case. Now, we know that a lot of folks also do onboarding and other activities in their LMS, so it's not uncommon to have community integrations in the LMS that are not specifically academic in nature. But for the purposes of this, we'll look at this example. And when you integrate into any system, um, so this is Canvas, if you're not familiar, the integration with a learning management system, regardless of which it, which it is, will look very similar to what we see here. Um, so all the major LMSs can be done. And then if you had like a portal or some other system, know that these same um, integration elements are available there as well. Um, but this is a use case that I think everybody kind of, kind of resonates with everyone. So you can keep it very simple and you can get very, very fancy. So the simplest would be to have a link to your community in your you know, left navigation or your top level navigation, whatever exists in the course. And that can be renamed to whatever you want it to be. And then um, it just provides a general link to take individuals to their community. Whenever you have a link to Inscribe, you can decide, do I want that link to launch it into a new tab? That, so the experience would be something similar to this, or do I wanna load within the context of the host system, I'll say. So what we're looking at here is what we call our embedded homepage. This is just loading in an iframe and keeping us in the context of the LMS. So lots of advantages to that, including not distracting your students so that when they do get their answer, they can get right back on task. Um, and I think it just looks really nicely integrated into um, the experience of what the student was already up to. 
And the great thing is you can do pretty much everything from this embedded view that you could do from the, um, the sort of independent view that we were looking at earlier. I can search, I can ask a question, I can see the things that are relevant to me. I actually get notifications here about, well, I've started three conversations and there's two new posts in my conversation. So I could go directly to that set of information and see what's new. And we're also gonna, again, encourage you to go look at any unanswered questions and help out your peers or your classmates. Um, I can also look at the content in here. So um, similar, I can you know, read the content, I can provide feedback, I still have all my moderator tools, or I can provide an answer or response directly within here. So that's that embedded view. So just keep in mind when you're doing links from other systems, um, you can always decide, what, do I want more of an embedded experience or do I want to launch out? In the LMS, we just use LTI for the integration. Um, we also can do SSO with your institution's central authentication system. So if they're coming to us from a website, for example, and they wanted to get into Inscribe, we could pop up your login process and they would enter their school credentials and then that would bring them into Inscribe. Now in the LMS specifically, you can get fancier. So let's say one common um, use case that we see is folks adding a, um, a link to the community for each week or each unit in the course. And so in this example, we're working on exponential functions. Now, when I've launched it, what I did with that link is I tagged it to the topic that we were learning in week two when I created it. And so now it looks very similar, but I'm pre-filtered down to the content that is most likely gonna be relevant to me because that's what I was learning. And if I go to ask a question, it will auto tag that for me as well. Um, so I don't have to think about it and that helps the teacher sort of understand or the faculty member understand how things are being organized. Um, and then if you wanted to kind of level up from that, uh, we do have a visual editor, a button in the visual editor. So anytime there's HTML in a platform, um, in Canvas, it's under your little plugins area. You can launch the Inscribe editor and it will walk you through a series of steps to create a link. So do I want to load that embedded homepage or, or do I want to go to one of these destinations on the Inscribe platform? Do I want to pre-filter it down to um, a particular topic area? So I'll just do this for now. Um, and then there we go. And then just click done and it will just add that link right to your community. And um, so uh, again, you can imagine if you really wanted to integrate Inscribe in a, you know, on every page and in every aspect of the LMS, you could do some really fancy things with that editor tool. But keep in mind that you don't need to do that to make the community useful. Just having it here in the left-hand navigation is a great way to provide that one-click access and make sure it's you know top of mind for students as well. Okay, pausing questions. Thank you. Yeah, there is a question in the in the chat. Um, it sounds like Inscribe can be customized many different ways. <laughs> so, can you tell us a little bit about what um, training setup and implementation looks like? How long does that typically take? Um, what's the process, etc.? Yes, great question. So although there is, not although, so Inscribe does have a lot of flexibility, but there's also a lot of commonality to how we see it being used. So kind of jumping back to those original use cases that we talked about, once we understand your goal, um, one or multiple goals for your community, we actually can bring to you, here's our recommended, recommended template for how to implement this community, which you can then decide to roll with or throw out or just make some adjustments and changes to. Um, and that includes you know, what to call the community, what topics to include, maybe a little bit of content to preload into the community um, and where to integrate it, et cetera. Um, so that helps streamline that process, I think. So you're, not really, you're never really starting from a blank slate. And then altogether, the implementation process includes the major buckets are just getting the technical integration done, um, getting this community set up and configured and loading any content that you'd like us to load for you. Uh, and then if you want, we'll do trainings for your team, virtual of course, um, but we can do one or multiple trainings, which we'll record. 
And then we have an entire support community, including spaces geared just to moderators. So tons of videos and resources that um, is content that will generally be covered in the training, but if people want a refresher or they get back to it, they can go to that community and they can also ask us questions there. So if they have a question about Inscribe and what they're doing, they can post there and we'll get back to them right away. Um, and then it's really about launch. So from end to end, we have implemented communities in under a week. Um, I would say the more common is two to three weeks. Um, and usually that's driven a lot by schedules and getting on the calendar, especially for the technical integration piece. But it really uh, doesn't take more than that to get it up and running at the start. Great, so you told you showed us the example of the integration within Canvas. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us the other LMSs that um, Inscribe integrates into? Yes, so it, today that includes Blackboard, D2L, Moodle, edX, um, and Canvas. I don't think I missed any there. And then we have had some requests. So we're looking at integrations with Schoology um, uh, and then a few other sort of like scaled learning providers. But it's LTI based. So if you have an LMS and it supports LTI, you know, we can get that done. It, it's very easy to get configured. And then on the SSO side, um, outside of the LMS, so SAML, Shibboleth, if you use Microsoft or Office 365, we can integrate with that. We can integrate with Google for education. So a lot of other standards that we can use even if we're not within the learning management system. A lot of options, beautiful. Okay, great. So one other thing I'll touch on is, because I know we're just almost at time, um, are the analytics. So um, we are, kind of tracking at the learning event level, what the participants in your community are doing. So within an individual community, the moderators and the community administrators can get an overview of kind of what's happening in your community. So how many new members are coming in? What's the sort of cadence of activity that you're seeing? What types of activity are people participating in? My demo community analytics are never very exciting. But usually for a really active community, these numbers, you know, will show you trends over time and you can start to identify peaks, you know, when midterms are coming up or when registration is due, you'll start to see peaks in activity. You can also see who in your community is really active and what components of the community they're interacting with. So what content, what questions are people really engaging with? And you can change the time lens of when you want to look at that. And then I'll just show you an example of where this is going. So um, over the next few months, we'll be adding to the visuals that you saw there. One, to, to make the analytics a little bit more actionable, um, and then also to create more visual cues to help you see you know, what's trending over time. And a couple of things to point out here. One is that we'll start to highlight which topics are trending. And our goal is to incorporate into that not just the topics that you have pre-identified, but to use some machine learning to extract topics from the conversations that we're seeing and let you know, you didn't really realize this, but everyone in your community is talking about, you know, asparagus. And that's something that's really important to students. They really care about it right now. So we're trying to help you kind of mine the data in your community so that you can think about what that means for your student community, um, your students on campus and where that information might be used um, in other conversations that you're having. So just know, and then I also will say behind the scenes that really granular student data. So that learning event data is always available to you either as an export um, or through API. So if you wanna take the data that you have in Inscribe and combine it with student success or activity data from other systems, it's really easy to do that. And we can provide that to you on whatever cadence works for you. All right, so I think we've touched on all of the major aspects. Um, again, just to reiterate the you know, Inscribe is designed to be really flexible, but also know that the team that you would be working with here has a lot of experience in launching these communities and a ton of best practices that we can bring to the table. We're very highly engaged to guide you through that process. So um, we can really help you think about what is it you want to achieve with your community and how do we configure and organize your community to help you hit those goals. And that is absolutely part of our, our mission. 
So with that, Danielle, any last questions coming in? That looks like it's it for now. I would just encourage anybody that has any additional questions to reach out to us at um, hello at inscribeapp.com. Thank you everyone so much. And uh, we did record the demo today. So we'll be making that available to you and on our website. So if you have other colleagues that you wanna share this demo with, um, please feel free to pass that along and reach out to us. We would love to, to talk with you all again soon.